Good morning. The Lord is risen today. world it was on before there we go I'm uh, out of practice let's have the greeting thank you
Kristus telah bangkit. Sungguh ia bangkit. Kristus eok sekalian. Ya, hana sana eok sekalian. Kristus ijindi. Ojindi lomto. Aku ayo dua ajindi. Kristus eok resisite. Ini vwelmo resisite. Keidok fokut leo. Ta zandek fokut leo. Jesus eok pustan. Jesus eok pustan. Jesus eok pustan. Christus is not a stand. I'm not a stand. Jesus is alive. He is alive. He is alive. Christ is risen. He is risen in the world. Hallelujah. I wish you a good day. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Scripture says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Welcome to St Andrew's Cathedral this Easter day. Please rise and sing to our risen Lord together.
You may be seated. And over the page, we still ourselves and prepare for all God has in store for us today. Together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it, love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Lord, have mercy on us and write your law in our hearts by your Holy Spirit. We humble ourselves before God in admission of our failures together. Merciful God, our maker and our judge, we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbour as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. Strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Almighty God, who has promised forgiveness to all who turn to him in faith, pardon you and set you free from all your sins, strengthen you to do his will, and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Archbishop, do you know what it means when I'm wearing this jacket? <laughs> it means I've got my hands full and I need someone to help with the actions for the kids' song, Archbishop. Oh, Archbishop, that would be wonderful. Karen is also going to help you to see what happens. This is the old traditional Easter Day song. He died upon the cross and we'll walk you through the actions. It's he died. You fold your arms uh, as you would, putting someone in a coffin, I guess died upon the cross and you repeat it, he died upon the cross one day when I was lost and you kind of like that, I don't know, what do you do? okay, is that lost? I think it's, that's, yeah that's lost, you're searching you're trying to work where you're trying to go, just watch your Archbishop can and uh, he will teach you the actions uh, he, uh, one day when I was lost, he died upon the cross. Oh, let's just repeat it. He, he, he died upon the cross. He died upon the cross. Now, the traditional form said, for me, for me, for just for me. And that's emphasising, boys and girls, don't ever think it's God, God loves other people and not you individually. Me individually. But it is very individualistic. So I've just changed the words a little bit to say, for me, for you, for me and you. Okay. And uh, the other verses, it's uh, pretty easy. Just follow these two or one or the other. <laughs> you can, um, this is the, uh, one of the few days of the year that, uh, just block your ears, Archbishop. Thank you. Children are allowed to stand on the pews this morning. Please stand. He died upon the cross. He died upon the cross. He died upon the cross. For me, for you, for me and you. One day when I was lost. He died upon the cross, he died upon the cross, for me, for you, for me and you. They laid him in the grave, they laid 
laid him in the grave. They laid him in the grave. For me, for you, for me and you. One day when I was lost, he died upon the cross. He died upon the cross. For me, for you, for me and you. He rose up from the dead. He rose up from the dead. He rose up from the dead. For me, for you, for me and you. One day when I was lost, he died upon the cross. He died upon the cross. For me, for you, for me and you. He's coming back again. He's coming back again. For me, for you, for me and you One day when I was lost He died upon the cross He died upon the cross For me, for you, for me and you You may be seated. And let's pray. Almighty God, you have conquered death through your dearly beloved Son, Jesus Christ, and opened to us the gate of everlasting life. By your grace, enable us to set our mind on things above, so that by your continual help, our whole life may be transformed through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit in everlasting glory. Amen. During the anthem, Karen and some of our helpers have some kids' packs. Maybe that we are so full this morning that kids in the same family might share one pack between them. We'll just see how we go. Please enjoy the ministry of our choir to you now.
now hear the word of the risen Lord Jesus as Alec brings us our first Bible reading. The reading is written in the 12th chapter of the book of Isaiah, beginning at the first verse. In that day you will say, I will praise you, O Lord, although you were angry with me, your anger has turned away, and you will comfort you have comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. With joy we will draw water from the wells of salvation. In that day you will say, Give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known among the nations what he has done, and proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the world. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel among you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This reading is from the book of Luke, chapter 24, beginning at verse 13. Now the same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them but they were kept from recognising him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early in the morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognised him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within in us while he walked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with him assembled together and saying, It's true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two 
told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognised by them when he broke the bread. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you very much, Leslie. Good morning. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. What a great joy it is to be able to meet together in this way and to lift our hearts in thanks and praise to God for all of his kindnesses towards us in the Lord Jesus. But we're very conscious as we meet on this Easter day that we cannot escape the pall of gloom that hangs over the world as news of the war in Ukraine in all of its horror and misery continues to filter through. We are dismayed and disgusted and angry and full of compassion and concern for the citizens of Ukraine fleeing their homes, suffering atrocities and fighting for their lives. And we're reminded too that Ukraine is not the only place in the world where the misery of war is unleashed. On a smaller scale but closer to home, we're conscious of those who've been left homeless because of floods, whole communities grappling with how to re-establish ordinary patterns of daily life, getting to work and getting the kids to school and running a business and making a living and having a place to come home to at the end of the day. And I think it's fair to say too that two years on from the beginning of the pandemic, every person is bearing the cost of disruption to long laid plans, lost opportunities, for celebration and anniversaries or even funerals and farewells. And the grief and uncertainty stored up after long, two long years of unpredictable, uh, ever-changing circumstances. A lot of us, I think, are just tired. So is Easter just a few days break and a chance to catch up with family and friends? For most of us, that's more than we've had of late and the long queues of people travelling interstate to see loved ones tells you how much we've missed it and how precious it is. But in fact, thank God, Easter is more. Easter announces hope for today and hope for eternity. Easter faces the grim horror of war, the shock and grief of natural disaster, and the grinding weariness of COVID disruption, and stares them all down. Jesus appears to his disciples and says, Peace be with you. Peace with God and peace from God. Peace in the midst of turmoil, disruption and war. Peace in the face of death and despair. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead means he is judge and king. He is Lord and saviour. He is God made man and victor over death. 
The future is in his hands and he will rescue and restore his people and punish and destroy evil, wiping away every tear and renewing the whole creation. The resurrection of Jesus is the source of peace in this world and the next. Now, to see how this can be, I want to think about the passage that was read to us from the end of Luke's Gospel. Uh, and you have it on page 7 of your outline. The passage begins, Now that same day. It's the same day that the women went to the tomb of Jesus and found that it was empty. It's Sunday, the first day of the week. The two disciples are leaving Jerusalem, but after their encounter with a stranger, they'll change their minds and change direction and return to Jerusalem, energised and confident with news to share. As they walk, we're told they're talking about everything that had happened in verse 14. When a stranger joins them and asks them what they are talking about, they respond in verse 18, are you the only one? who doesn't know the things that have happened. And Jesus replies, and I'm tempted to think he may have been smiling when he said this, what things? So I want to think with you about what happened, what does it mean, and why does it matter? What happened? The two disciples tell their apparently uninformed companion what they've been discussing in verse 19 about Jesus of Nazareth. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him, but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. They summarise Jesus' life and ministry. They call him a prophet, nothing more. He was a teacher, a healer, accredited by God, performing miracles, amazing people with the depth and clarity and power of his teaching, so that just a week earlier they had acclaimed him king as he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Their nation was occupied, subjected to a foreign power, and now they're leaving Jerusalem. Their hopes and dreams for Israel's liberation from the Roman Empire had been dashed with the crucifixion of the one whom they had thought was the Messiah. They are dispirited, dismayed, and dejected. All of it had come to nothing. The third day, we're going home. But there's a puzzle. They tell Jesus, some of our women amazed us. Verse 22, they went to the tomb early in the morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. Here are the facts as they know them, the data. Jesus was a prophet acclaimed by God and the people. Their leaders handed him over to the Gentiles who put him to death on a cross. He was laid in a tomb, but on the third day, the tomb was empty. Now, it is widely accepted among scholars that the death of Jesus is one of the best attested facts in ancient history, which, by the way, dispels any notion that he never existed. Even the most sceptical of scholars agree that the crucifixion of Jesus at the hands of Pontius Pilate, prefect of Judea, is virtually indisputable. Was the tomb empty? If it was not, then surely the body of Jesus would have been produced. His enemies had no reason to hide, uh, uh, had every reason to produce it. His enemies had every reason to produce the body. His disciples had no reason to hide it. There was no value in a made-up story of Jesus being raised. Who would believe it? And why would anyone die for a story they themselves made up? More than that, what could have energised their preaching to such an extent that the Christian movement grew from 11 frightened disciples following Jesus' death to an estimated 20 million believers by the beginning of the fourth century before the conversion of the Emperor Constantine. 
The witness of the Gospels is that Jesus' tomb was empty because he was alive and his resurrection was confirmed by his appearance to numerous disciples on numerous occasions over several weeks. But it's clear from Luke's account that the disciples knew that Jesus had died, were not expecting that he would be resurrected, and they struggled to believe it even when he appeared to them. When Jesus meets the disciples on the road to Emmaus, they're dejected. They don't think the crucifixion was the fulfilment of God's plan. They think it's all failed and their hopes have been dashed. When Jesus appears to the twelve, he he says, why do you doubt? Why are your hearts so troubled? Luke says they were frightened and startled and did not believe. Jesus has to convince them. He says, look, look at my hands and feet. It is I. Touch me and see. And just for good measure, have you got anything to eat? I'm not a ghost. No doubt his body had been transformed, but it was certainly him. Jesus says to the two on the road in verse 25, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. They have the facts, they have the data, but they don't understand. They have the events of those days, but not the explanation. They have the pieces, but not the full picture. They need a a tutorial, and they get one from Jesus himself. They can say what happened, but not what it means. So second, what does it mean? Jesus says in verse 26, Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Moses and all the prophets, that's a way of referring to the Hebrew scriptures, the Hebrew Bible. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself himself. The death and resurrection of Jesus is the fulfilment of God's plan revealed in all of Scripture. The death and resurrection of Jesus is the fulfilment of God's plan revealed in all of Scripture. Now, we don't know the content of the disciples, uh, the disciples' one-on-one Bible study uh, with the resurrected Jesus. That would have been something, wouldn't it? But Luke doesn't tell us what he said because his point is that the raw data of what took place is not enough on its own to move the disciples from despair and doubt to confidence and joy. The death and resurrection of Jesus need interpretation and that interpretation comes from Scripture, which is why in verse 16 we're told that the disciples were kept from recognizing him. They were kept from recognizing him, which suggests that if they weren't kept from recognizing him, they would have recognized him. Why were they kept from recognizing him? I think it's so that they would learn that the meaning of what had happened was already contained in Scripture. He explained to them what was said in all the Scriptures concerning himself. So here's the point. The Bible is a book about Jesus, the whole Bible. And the resurrection means that we should take what the Bible says about Jesus with the utmost seriousness. They were kept from recognising who Jesus was because the Scriptures are enough to explain the events of his life. In the parable that Jesus tells in Luke 16 of Lazarus and the rich man, Uh, Lazarus is in paradise, the rich man is in hell, and he asks Father Abraham to send someone back from the dead to warn his brothers of what awaits them if they do not repent. And Abraham says, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, if they don't listen to Scripture, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. But in the kindness and mercy of God, Jesus was raised from the dead. 
had explained to them, verse 27, what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And as Jesus shares a meal with them afterwards, after their Bible study, they recognise him. But as soon as they do, he leaves them. And the two disciples say in verse 32, did not our hearts burn within us when he talked to us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Their eyes were opened and their hearts set aflame as Jesus explained the scriptures to them. People sometimes say, if only Jesus could appear before me, then I would believe. But Jesus taught that scripture contains everything we need to know about him. Now, I'm delighted to let you know that the cathedral will be running a short course starting next Sunday afternoon called Simply Christianity. The details about it are on the back of your program there. Uh, when you can read the whole of the Gospel of Luke and ask any question you'd like to ask. Uh, I want to commend it to you. It'll be available on Zoom as well and also in Mandarin at a different time. And uh, by all means, take up that opportunity. If the resurrection is true, then it is absolutely vital that you understand who Jesus is. It is unavoidably supernatural and unpredictable and unexpected. But if it's true, it's vital that you understand who Jesus is. If it's not true, as Greg Sheridan said in his Australian article yesterday, it doesn't matter at all. But if it is true, well, that brings me to our third point. Why does it matter? Why does it matter? Verse 36, Jesus stood in the midst of them and said to them, peace be with you. And I want to mention briefly three aspects of the peace that Jesus brings. Peace with God, peace in our hearts, peace in the world. Peace with God. The resurrection of Jesus confirms that Jesus is able to forgive sin and make us at peace with God forever. Isaiah 53 famously speaks of the servant of the Lord who was pierced for our transgressions. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, the prophet says. And he continues, though it was the Lord's will to crush him and make his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days and the, Lord, the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. King David says, you will not let your Holy One see decay. And in the New Testament, as we began our service this morning, the Apostle Peter writes, in his great mercy, God has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. The resurrection means that Jesus is able to forgive sin and make us at peace with God forever. Secondly, peace in our hearts. In the Old Testament book of Ezekiel, the prophet is given a vision of a valley of dry bones, and the bones are knitted together and clothed with flesh and caused to live again. And in chapter 37, verse 12 of Ezekiel, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, my people, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live. And he says, I will give you a new spirit and I will take your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. The gift of God's Spirit, who is His presence with us and His power to transform us and to equip us for His service and to guide us into the truth and into the way of peace, the gift of the Spirit who lives in Christ's people is a gift of the resurrection. Resurrection means the risen Jesus will give his spirit to those who trust in his gospel. And thirdly, peace in the world. Jesus' resurrection from the dead is the first fruit, the first of the harvest of the coming new creation. Isaiah says in chapter 25 at verse 8, 
the Lord will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. When death is swallowed up by life, the new creation comes that brings healing to God's people and finally to the whole creation. In the New Testament, the Apostle writes, the Apostle Paul writes, Jesus died for all that they might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again for their sake. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Jesus' resurrection, the first fruits of the new world coming, where every tear is wiped away. We live for now, we know too well, with the ravages of our sin and the sin of others. We are so conscious of the fragility of life in the face of natural disaster and global pandemic. We weep over the evil of humankind that makes for war and the greed and struggle for power that makes it harder to bring the suffering of people to an end. But in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are offered peace, forgiveness and adoption into God's family, the presence and power of Christ with us by his spirit, the promise of a new creation where every tear will be wiped away and wars made to cease. In a world of sin and sorrow, I know no better news, no better hope, no more abiding peace than this. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Thank you, Archbishop. Jesus said to them, peace be with you. We now sing to praise him. What depths of peace with God, with one another and in the world to come in the risen Christ alone. Please stand.
seated as my colleague Ruth leads us in our prayers. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you that across your world, your people are remembering and rejoicing that Christ has indeed been raised from the dead and that through him we need no longer fear death. As Christians gather together today, we ask that through the preaching of your powerful word, you will provide hope and encouragement. For those who are weary and despondent, please lift up their heads and strengthen them in love. For those who are sick or grieving, please, co please comfort them and renew their hope. For those who are fearful, who meet in places where it is not safe to proclaim the name of Jesus, protect them, we pray, so that they may rejoice with us that Christ has risen. God of the nations, we pray for those countries where peace, safety, and hope seem unobtainable. Lord, you know everything, you see everything. You know the evil that makes for war, and you see the pain and suffering of every single person. Merciful God, we ask you to bring an end to the war in Ukraine. Father, we pray for those who have lost family members, those who are now homeless, and especially for women in that country. Draw near to them, we pray, protect them from further harm. And as we watch on from afar, safe in our homes and in this country, we ask that you give us a deep concern for our fellow humans and the desire to pray for those who are being subjected to a depravity that we cannot imagine. Father, we pray for those whom you have placed in positions of leadership. We thank you that many leaders throughout the world endeavor to govern with wisdom and show genuine care for those they serve. Please guard them from temptation to serve themselves. And as the election looms in this country, we pray for our politicians. We ask that you guide them in ways that are transparent and decent as they seek to persuade voters. Would we be eager to pray for our leaders throughout this process, committing them to you and asking you to equip them with what they need to serve with integrity, humility, and focus. Ultimately, Lord, we pray for leaders who submit to your authority and who strive to imitate the grace-filled leadership of the Lord Jesus. And Lord, we thank you that at last we are able to travel and to be united with family and friends in other places and countries. And we pray that as people move around this country and across continents, that you would provide safe passage on our roads and in the air. We pray for our police and emergency services. Thank you that we are so well provided for if things go wrong. Please protect them in their work. Give them wisdom and courage as they face difficult situations. And we also pray for those working in our hospitals throughout this time. We thank you for their commitment to bringing health and healing, for caring and persevering, especially after such an arduous couple of years. Provide for their needs as they provide for ours. And we pray that they too would be able to spend time with those they love over the holiday period. Almighty God, draw near to the brokenhearted and the broken-spirited. May the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus be a powerful reminder of your love for humanity and your promise to make all things new. And we pray all these things through Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit in everlasting glory. Amen. Thank you. 
We come now to the Lord's Supper. We're encouraged to feast on Christ by faith. The first thing to say is uh, to all those who are visitors here at the cathedral, if you know and love the Lord Jesus Christ as your own Lord and Saviour, and you'd normally take communion in your own church, you are more than welcome, of course, to share with us today. The cathedral is very full. Hallelujah for that after COVID. Uh, but it will be uh, a crowded process. So let me explain. We have four serving points for each of the aisles. The north aisle will be served uh, over adjacent to the north entry, centre aisle uh, adjacent to the pulpit, uh, the centre aisle on my side, next to the Bible reading station, and those in the, le- uh, the, the southernmost aisle, uh, just north, uh, just west of the brass. Those who are sitting in the gallery and behind the choir should follow, in fact, you should all follow the directions of the ushers. Please don't all crowd into the aisles so that we have an enormously long queue. Uh, we're still trying to, well, it's a bit impossible, the distancing thing, but just to avoid a traffic jam, if you'd wait for the ushers, Uh, to bring you forward. When you get to the serving station, please eat and drink as the ministers give you the words of encouragement and there are trays for the empty cups. It's all individual cups because of COVID and you can put them in and return to your seats. Archbishop. Hear the word of the Lord. Whenever you eat this bread, and drink this cup. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves, and only then eat the bread and drink from the cup. Let us pray. We do not presume to come to your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your boundless goodness and mercy. We are not even worthy to eat the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, always rich in mercy. Enable us by faith to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may be cleansed from sin and forever dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. And hear these words of Jesus, who said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Therefore, lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Always and everywhere, it is right for us to praise you, Lord, Holy Father, mighty Creator, and eternal God. We praise you especially for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. He is the true Passover lamb who who was offered for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death, he has destroyed death. By his rising to life again, he has restored to us eternal life. Therefore, with all those gathered around your throne in heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name in words of never-ending praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Glory to you, Lord Most High. We thank you, Father, that on the night before he died, Jesus took bread. And when he'd given you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the meal, he took the cup, and again, giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, 
in remembrance of me. Therefore, Father, we thank you for these gifts of bread and wine and pray that we who eat and drink them in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, believing our Saviour's word, may be partakers of his body and blood. To Jesus Christ, who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. Come, let us eat and drink in remembrance that Christ died for us and feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. And I did forget to say all the bread is gluten-free and uh, there's a clearly marked choice of wine or juice. The wine is the darker liquid.
I lead us in prayer. Lord and Heavenly Father, in your loving kindness, accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Grant that by the merits and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and your whole church may receive forgiveness of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. With gratitude for all your mercies, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice through Jesus Christ our Lord. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Thank you for being here with us and sharing this delight of the risen Christ this Easter morn. Uh, you're welcome next Sunday. It's Anzac Sunday and it'll be another special service here in the cathedral. We'd love to see you. Uh, if you'd like to leave your gifts uh, for the work of the ministry on the way out, there are collection points and even tap-and-go stations if you don't use the electronic means. Now let us stand and sing glory to God. Blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In, in the name, name of Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen.